welcome to another episode of Conversations with Annie and Kate. Today our guest is Annalee Killian and Annalee says that her life purpose is all about connecting smart thinkers and doers to wicked challenges for insights and solutions to make the world a better place. She, when I met her, was the catalyst for magic at a financial services organisation in Sydney, Australia. But now she's based in New York. She has done really amazing things in her career. She's an Aspen Institute First Movers Fellow. She's a graduate of the Singularity University Executive Program. She's an advisor to a number of international accelerators and startups. And she's the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships at Sparks and Honey. And she has an immense network of game changers and movers and shakers. Welcome, Emily. Hi, Annie. Hi, hi, lovely to see you. So nice to meet you, Annalie. What an incredible resume and, you know, kind of what I love about it as well is it's sort of this collection of things rather than a linear, you know, sort of career path. So I'm really fascinated to talk to you about all of that. Yes, yes. If, if, if you didn't sort of see my body, you would swear I was a trapeze artist. <laughs> I sort of see, see career as a trapeze act. Love oh, it. Totally, totally. So what are we drinking? I've got tea in my um, Chairman Meow mug, which uh -huh. I've What's got a tea though. It's uh, English breakfast. Good work, good work. I'm, I'm still on the lemon and ginger tea uh, with extra lemon from my lemon trees outside uh, in my Harry Potter Marauder's Map mug, which Really, the reason why I love this is it's massive, so you can fit a lot of tea into it. There we go. Oh, I don't know. That seems to be... Oh, the, 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 green, the green screen just made it look like you're sipping a palm tree. No, it's magic. <laughs> it's actually magic. There you go. How about you, Annalie? What are you drinking? Well, I just had a two hours financial planning session with my financial advisor back in Sydney and I managed to kill two Aperol spritzes and now I'm out of Aperol and I'm just gonna have to have the Prosecco by itself so cheers. <laughs> cheers. <laughs> like your style. We need to clarify it's night time where Emily is in New York and yeah, it's like nine o'clock. <laughs> yeah it's nine o'clock. All right Annie do you want to go with, with, with your first question? I do, and if it's okay, I'm just going to ask you, um, given that we're in you know, such a, an unusual time with COVID and, and lots of other you know, sort of uh, societal issues going on out there, I just wanted to ask you, Annalie, how you approach self-care. What do you do to take care of yourself? Oh, I thought I deliberately took that question off because I don't practice self-care. <laughs> oh, well, that's interesting, though. So what... <laughs> Is there, a, is there any reason why you don't? I, I guess, I guess self-care is all relative, isn't it? I mean, it's like, as um, the, the, the dictionary, uh, no, I suppose the conventional wisdom is that you need to sleep eight hours. Well, I have never slept eight hours in my entire life. And, um, now is like really bad for that because just not enough natural sunlight vitamin d is a problem staying indoors sitting in front of a screen really long hours and when you were finished with work then you go on a screen to socialize and maintain your relationships and um so i spend my my two daughters are in europe my mom is in Cape Town. She's just been diagnosed with uh, rare cancer at 87. So that's kind of draining. And my ex-husband is still having problems in Sydney. And then uh, my friends are all over the world. So I kind of like, I'm, I'm, I'm a, around the clock on, on life. <laughs> so I, I guess um, I practice self-care by maintaining relationships and being closely connected with the people that I love. And if that means that I spend a lot of time online and um, not in bed sleeping, then so be it. Got you. Yes, it's, it's a, an interesting, so I'm originally from the UK, moved here to Australia seven years ago, and my, my friend network is all distributed around the world as well. And in some ways it, it is harder because you've got so many time zones to navigate with. But it also does mean that if you are having a random sleepless night, someone somewhere in the world is awake and you can have a chat with them. 
which is just marvelous. Oh, I know. I have posted like it's three o'clock in the morning and I can't sleep. And people kind of go, what, you too? <laughs> it's, it's a thing. I think it's a thing. There's kind of a pandemic um, sleeplessness too that seems to be happening, you know, and I suspect that's due to rising anxiety levels. Yeah, I think it's that, but I, I think our biorhythms are also um, thrown out a little bit. I mean, I do, I've do. i never been an early sleeper, um, and I don't wear this as a badge of pride. I, I have at times in my life tried to discipline myself, go to bed at 10 o'clock, and then I might fall asleep, but like literally at midnight, I'm wide awake, and then it's wide awake till 4 a.m., so um, I now tend to go to bed um, when I'm exhausted, you know, like I get into bed around 11 midnight and then I might be up until 1, 1 1.30 doing stuff, but then I sleep until 9 o'clock. So that's okay. Yep, that's pretty much my schedule too. And, <laughs> you know, I, I hate when you see all of these... Uh, tips for successful entrepreneurs and they all get up at 5am and do yoga and run 10 kilometers and stuff. I just think that's anathema to me. I do not want to do that. I know, but I mean, isn't that what the point of diversity is? Like people make out like there's just one recipe for happiness and for success. And I mean, we know this is not true. We know this isn't true. So some people peak late at night. I peak late at night. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a late starter for, due, for things that have due dates. I can't start till the day before. So. Oh, I, I love a deadline to focus the mind. Yeah, it's good. Well, the other thing is if you leave it till the last minute, you typic I typically find stuff that is really important to add into whatever it is I'm doing, whether it's a piece of research or a person I've just spoken to. So if I did all the work earlier, I'd only have to do it again. And oftentimes I found as well as um, on some deadlines, leaving it till the last minute means that sometimes you end up not wasting any work as well because sometimes deadlines yeah. move or priorities change. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely a last minute chancer as well. Well, here's what I think about it is um, I tend to start my thinking early. And so I would like literally sort of prepare my mind. So I'm writing an article at the moment and I know I'm only going to be handing it in and furiously writing it in the last, you know, weekend or something. But I started really early on with what do I want to communicate? What are the key points? And then, you know, I did a little bit of research around that. The big challenge is not to over think it because you can then get yourself into a, a, a tailspin and say, oh my God, this is bigger than being her. I can't finish it. Um, so the, the fact, but I, I find that it's like, you know, it's filtering your thoughts, this long process. And then by the time that you get down to do the final writing, it's very crystal clear and it flows easily. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting, uh, because that leads into my question, which is, is, is about some books that you might recommend. What, what, what ones would you recommend, Annalie? Oh, uh, geez. Some of, some of the things that sort of stay with me are things that I think um, became pivotal in my life in terms of really just something that I can kind of anchor around. Um, one very big life change that I made was um, when I read a book by M. Scott Peck a long, long time ago, was um, The Road Less Traveled. And what was really interesting for me about that was probably the first self-help book that I ever read. And um, it was so dense and I would read two or three pages and go, oh my God, let me read that again, what? Um, so, and it was because I think it was very relevant to that. The reason why I picked up that book was that I had a lot of questions and difficult decisions to face. It had to do with my marriage and where I was gonna go and 
you know, confronting my values and thinking about my children and my family and my, my whole everything. Um, so that's a perennial favorite. One of the big insights from that book was, um, you know, around tough love. Uh, that is a hard one. And it was really something that helped me understand a lot of things about myself. Um, second one was, um, something that I believe is like when you discover something like that, it's like the keys to the universe. Um, and it was a book called Tiny Habits by Professor B.J. Fogg from Stanford University. And it's really like taking his model for how you shape behavior um, and then apply that in a personal capacity. And so through Tiny Habits, I picked up, you know, the, the sort of like ways in which to maintain change in my life. Um, and so that helped me with weight loss. It's helped me with, you know, learning to journal. It's helped me with time management. It hasn't helped me with sleep yet, but that's just because I think I give in to the um, impulse of instant gratification there. Um, and then um, I'm reading something right now that is a book that is about to come out. Um, it's by one of the speakers that I uh, had at Amplify Festival a few times in Australia. Uh, he's a musician originally by profession. His name is um, David Price. So David Price um, was a career musician and then he ended up in education and then he became an innovator in education and most recently is an author around, um, you know, emerging trends and societal shifts. And what I love about this book, The Power of Us, which is coming out on the 28th of August, is that David has written, written a business book, but it's literally like you and I are having a conversation. It's like you're at a dinner party and this is the conversation. And so that's how it reads. And I just love it so much. And I think that what is so unique about it is because David, um, most part of his you know, early career was as a musician, he sees things in a very different way. And I think he sees the harmonizing in the noise that allows him to see it before other people do. And he makes it so clear and so um, compelling. So I do recommend that book, The Power of Us. It's really about how, um, how collaboration is happening to solve big challenges and, and correct social ills and wrongs um, through values-driven society. You, you're in New York now. What, what's, what's it like there? You know, I love New York. That's why I came here. Um, it's been a dream since I was a teenager to live and work in New York. And I still love it. I love it really probably even more now, despite the fact that the city is very damaged. Um, but it's the spirit of New Yorkers that makes the city so unique. So it's without fail people everywhere, they obey the mask rule. They really get that we're, um, our actions are are there to protect each other and together we're better um, than to, you know, that's kind of the New York way. And I love the city for that reason. Um, people here have gone out of their way to try and keep the restaurants going. So a uh, lot of, I mean, we, we've been maintaining, we didn't, I don't particularly, I'm not a particularly an order in kind of a person. I'm a go out person, but you know, we decided that it's our moral duty as citizens to make sure that these people have jobs. Um, so we order in rather than prepare it ourselves. Um, and people tip very generously and, and so on. It's just, just wonderful. So I still love it. Um, but the city is very damaged. You've traveled a lot with your role and also you're you know, originally from South Africa, you've lived here in Australia, you've lived in the US. You know, is that something that's always been part of your you know, kind of drive, the, the travel, the wanting to see new places? I guess so, you know, I don't know. Um, 
uh, people say that the Sagittarians are the wandering star, you know, like itchy feet Sagittarians. And maybe if there is anything in the sort of star signs, then I'm definitely got a good dose of that. But I think it's also inherently typical for curious people. So I have a very curious mind and um, I like to, I, I, I get, I don't know, I just like to explore. So if you want to kill me, give me routine. So I don't do well with routine. And that's one of the reasons why I love my current job so much because there's not so much routine in it. Um, but my, my grandmother, if she was still alive, would tell you that when I was, you know, yay, hi, um, and she would read me stories about Heidi and Little Red Riding Hood and, you know, these stories, I would always say like, okay, so where is their house? Because I don't see mountains. And this was growing up in Johannesburg. And if we went on a ride, a drive in the car on a Sunday afternoon, as you used to do for entertainment in those days, um, we'd drive maybe past a small forest and I'd say, oh, is this where Little Red Riding Hood lives, you know, or whatever. But the moment that my grandma explained to me that, no, there is this place called Switzerland and it's not in South Africa and it's this place where there's this high mountains where Heidi lives. I just knew when I was three years old, okay, I got to go there. Um, and so many, many of these things became just part of the ambition. I had my first flight. Now, this is not something funny for millennials. My kids flew when they were days old, but... I'm 58 and I had my first flight when I was six years old. And then I went every two years flying somewhere and that was very unheard of for my generation. And uh, people used to say to me like, so, so how do you do it? I said, well, I would just find out where we've got a distant relative and then make myself invited there. <laughs> I said to my parents, no, I've got to go and visit these people. <laughs> so that's what I did. I've been traveling a lot since I was little and be very inventive about it. Is, is that why you did the, the high school exchange? You did a high school exchange in Australia, didn't you? Yes, yes, a Rotary Youth Exchange. Um, so I went to Australia for a year. Uh, that was my first international trip. Um, and then I got back to Australia, no, back to South Africa. And I had, I was like, oh, couldn't wait to have more of it. And so... Uh, I enrolled at university and um, realized I was going to be a pauper for a long time and not have enough money to travel. And so I would sort of like go to the travel agencies. Remember those days we had travel agencies and they'd have all these brochures and I would sort of like take one from each country and I'd go back home and I'd be flicking through these brochures and then I stumbled upon the fine print and um, one of them was a magazine called uh, Trek America. And it was sort of like camping trips for the 18 to 35 year old. And I'm like, geez, I'd really like to go and do this sort of coast to coast thing across America. Um, and then I read that if you got 15 people, the sixth, and you filled a little bus, the 16th person travels, no, sorry, it was, 13. If you got 13 people, the 14th person travels for free. So I thought, wow, I'm at a university. There's a lot of young people here. They must have money because otherwise they wouldn't be at university. I'll just create um, a tour. I'll go and see if I can fill the bus. And so I filled three buses. <laughs> <laughs> and so all of us, off we went to America. Um, and what the irony was when the student dean found out, he said, well, you can't advertise on campus because, you know, their parents would think it's an officially sanctioned university tour. So I'm going to have to forbid you from um, communicating on campus unless you take, a, you know, a faculty member to be a chaperone. I mean, okay, fine. So there goes two free seats because he then wanted to bring his wife and I had planned on cashing in and using that as pocket money. So I then had to, you know, compromise and take this guy um, and his wife on the tour. But then we couldn't put all three of the buses in the same direction. So I worked out that the bus that I would go on would be with all the fun people and um, 
that'll be the party bus. And it went from west to east coast and the other two went from east to west and we sort of met up in the middle somewhere on the New Mexico border. And when we met there, I kind of came to hear that this faculty member was paying nightly visits to some of the girls' tents. So the chaperone was actually wolf in sheep's clothing. So I was going to, I sort of thought afterwards, I should go back to that student dean and say, pay up, mate. <laughs> yeah, I just, um, I have some blackmail here, but I didn't do that. But it was just like, so uh, ironic, isn't it? Like, I'm forced into this situation to take a faculty member as a chaperone and then he couldn't keep his um, underwear on. So goes the world. Yeah. 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 Nothing's changed. Nothing has changed, yes. And his wife's fast asleep in her own tent. Oh, that makes my blood boil. Mm. Yeah. But it was a brush with real politic really early in, in your life, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. It kind of even, you know, like you learn, you learn, I mean, like sexual harassment and so on today, you know, I know that it's a very fraught topic, but I worked as a waitress from a very young age in high school. And I mean, like, I could tell you so many sexual harassment stories. Um, just everybody, like all, all the people my age, I'm sure all of you have stories like that to tell. So, you know, it's, it's the right thing. You know, it's actually been a recurring theme that, you know, the, the cognitive load on women because of that, you know, am I dressing provocatively? Will I be inviting this, you know, is, is quite substantial. Sorry, any you were saying? I was just going to say the thing that always jumps out for me, particularly when I speak to guys who say, well, you know, I've never done that. You go, I completely believe you because I think that m quite a lot of, you know, the guys that we associate with in startup land and in innovation world, you know, they're good people. But the piece that I always remind them of is every single woman has a story. So even though you might not have been part of the, you know, kind of the reason why, Every single woman, particularly women in tech and women in you know, kind of enterprise or corporate businesses, we all have a story. And I mm -hmm. find that part is just, it, it seems to be the thing that seems to sort of switch most of the men's brains around for me, which is, I get that it wasn't you, not all men, hashtag, but every woman has a story without. Yeah. So yeah. one of your like friends, you know, question was doing that. Sorry, say that again. Which one of which one of their friends was doing it? If they weren't doing it, who that's among their friends was, and why didn't they stop it? That's what I want to yeah, know. Yeah, I think that's the point. Is that many of them were aware that that sort of thing goes on, but you know they don't get involved. Mm. Yeah, I'm interested to talk about your Amplify years. So, tell us about Amplify. Oh, wow, that was such a fun time. Um, so I was working at uh, AMP at the time and um, I was asked to help build a culture of innovation working with the CIO at the time. And um, it, was, <laughs> it was during one of those many tumultuous years at AMP, this particular time was um, literally probably around about 2002, 2003, um, the, uh, but was before, before the CEO got sacked. Uh, that, that, that time it was Paul Batchelor. And so uh, uh, we were building, working with um, a, a group to sort of, um, say, okay, so how would the company continue to innovate, et cetera, et cetera. It was very early days on innovation. And uh, my boss, who was the CIO, was part of this leadership group to work out how to build a culture of innovation and made a presentation. And at the time, this presentation was really ill-timed because the company was in so much financial distress. And so the 
rest of the management team said, no bloody way, you know, like we're bleeding. Um, and so nothing kind of came of it. And then shortly thereafter, um, um, the CIO turned around and said to me, well, if the whole company doesn't want to go on this journey, you know, I want, I want to invest in this for the IT community and I want you to lead innovation. And it was kind of interesting because I didn't, I mean, in those days, we're talking 2003, nobody was, you know, innovating per se. It wasn't a, I, I remember doing a Google search on innovation and there was like 3,000, uh, 3,000 terms came up on the, on, on the word innovation, 3,000 search results. Um, and, you know, today it would be many, many more. But as I embarked on this journey, I found, oh my God, you know, what, what, I, what I think we're really missing here is, is a culture of learning and a culture of curiosity because when people are naturally curious and they sort of start um, looking for things and they're open-minded and uh, they're constantly learning, it's kind of inevitable that most people have the ability to be innovative. But I found that the company was not a learning culture. And so um, I decided that how can I fix that when I didn't have much budget, um, I didn't have a corporate mandate to uh, bring the whole company on board, I only had a mandate for the IT community. So I learned from literally studying um, how ecosystems change. So I paid a lot of attention to creative emergence in ecosystems to say, well, what could I learn from that and then bring into this ecosystem, um, you know, from a design principle perspective. And I came to the conclusion that I had to build curiosity as a groundswell movement and get people to be exposed and excited about new things and learning and new insights. And so that's how Amplify was founded. Um, one of the other things that I've never shared with people was that at the start, I had a really strong vision um, for it. Right in the very beginning is I thought the business that we were in, um, AMP's business was um, to help people procure their future, you know, financially. So really at the bottom, you know, bottom line was company would say, hand your money to us um, so that we can safeguard it and grow it for you. So that when you're um, in your old age and you need it, you know, we can hand you a, a, a nice lump sum of money back or, you know, that you'll have something for your retirement. So it was like, trust us to secure the future for you. And then I thought, well, if we are not investing in understanding this future, then how can we actually deliver on this promise? So I thought, well, the best piece of that would be if we became future hunters uh, and we could say as a brand that it's really, really important that we need to anticipate the future and build an anticipatory culture so that we can be the, the very best uh, managers of people's money um, so that we can deliver on the brand promise. So that was the whole idea of investing in um, a festival of learning that was very much future focused around like emerging technologies, emerging shifts in consumer behaviors, new patterns, new innovations, that sort of thing. And then I created um, an opportunity to invite everybody in the whole company to um, embark on this kind of learning adventure. It wasn't exclusive, it wasn't just for the anointed few because that's the learning model of most organizations is that, you know, this is just the princess, crown princess and princesses that get to go off and do some exotic program and the rest of the people have to make do with some boring online class or something. And so I wanted to excite people with the possibilities that uh, learning could unlock. So you brought in some really amazing names like BJ Falk was one of one of the people, you know, there's a list of luminaries. So you created this 
the event in Sydney that was open to everyone in the organisation. Yeah, and then eventually we grew it to say that, I mean, one of the guiding principles of the design was always openness. And so I basically, from the very beginning, wanted to have an open event that we could invite our partners, our customers, our, our um, suppliers, um, and the general public, anybody who wanted to learn, the, this was an open door for learning together because I think the togetherness and the openness drove a lot of value in itself. I remember in some of the, the sessions, particularly when we started opening it up to the public, best questions at the end of each session, because we sort of designed the sessions that it was like a kind of a 20 minute talk by the expert and then a facilitated conversation um, with somebody interviewing the expert uh, for another 15 minutes and then open questions to the floor. So the audience kind of got about half of the time and the speaker got about half of the time. But the best questions came from the floor and often from people from the outside and the learning was usually embedded through those questions. The questions were great. So I've seen on your wonderful, you know, sort of uh, career profile, you talk, you talk a lot about some of the board positions you hold and I saw one of them was the uh, NYC Innovation Collective. I'd love to learn a little bit more about that because you're seeing so many startups with founders who are all, you know, sort of inspired to solve a problem in some way, shape or form in a new crazy way. That must be really um, yeah, interesting to obviously see lots of ideas coming through, but how did that, how did that role come across for you? Uh, so that was an ambassadorial role to be a sort of a bridge between the business community and the startup communities. Um, the New York City Innovation Collective is, um, it's like an umbrella body for the accelerators in New York. They were, uh, um, I'm no longer on the board, but they were around, geez, about 125 accelerators who were members. And the whole idea of the umbrella body was to say, how do we make um, the process of building incubators and accelerators consistent so that um, this becomes a capability that we could scale across the city? Because certain accelerators were doing it well, but we wanted to replicate that, whether it was the food industry or the space industry or the um the data industry etc they were specialized accelerators there's a fashion accelerator there's all sorts of um, accelerators how could they learn from each other and then you know replicate success at scale and i think that was a very interesting model in terms of thinking about building capacity uh, for making your city an innovation city very cool and they said yeah, having worked in lots of different cities around the world, does does New York have something that perhaps other places in the world don't have when it comes to innovation? Um, everything I say now is obviously um, pre-COVID. <laughs> sure. I think that the, th the, the magic of New York was that it, it's an icon. It's a place that for its sheer size and gravity, it attracts the smartest and it, it, it's a concentration of smart people as well as money. And then it's got this sort of like um, iconic cult status that, you know, if you can make it in New York, you can kind of make it anywhere. And that in itself means it's, it's aspirational. People are drawn to the city. So since I moved here uh, five years ago, I would say, I don't have to go anywhere else because everybody is eventually coming to New York. <laughs> so it's just a hotbed um, because of its size and its economic um, 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 activity across a, a wide uh, 
range of sectors where you know it's got some of the very best it's got the best of music the best of theater the best of um financials i suppose wall street um uh, and and then it attracts talent mm -hmm. and so innovators want to be where talent is and uh so all of this is pre-COVID, so it waits one, one, it's interesting to sort of see what develops now because I think eventually cities can become too expensive um, and then eventually uh, they, um, uh, they force people and startups in particular to go somewhere else. But New York's kind of a place where the money is attracted to and then when the money is there, other things come. Now, how do you think that COVID could potentially change the, not just New York, but the world? Do you think that it could lend itself to creating a new sort of community consciousness for change? Like that last book that you mentioned? Uh, yes. I mean, I do think that... Um the very fact that there are something like 85 vaccines being developed at breakneck speed because of open collaboration um, is one example of that, that people are literally just banding together to um, make the world better for everybody else by finding, you know, solution to this problem. And um, I, I saw when there was PPE shortages. Do you know the very first moment that I knew there was going to be a big problem was I think the morning of the 8th of February, very, very early on. It was a Sunday morning. I woke up to um, a Facebook post from one of our advisory board members who was, um, you know, she's got a lot of interests in China. And she posted that, can anybody help her find um, PPE? She needs 20,000 protective clothing suits and surgical masks to send to China. There is a cash donor uh, who will charter a plane and send it out. We just need to try and get hold of it. And because I'm well connected and uh, I, I have friends in high places, I thought, I'm going to jump on this because the more we can help China to, um, um, main, you know, like get on top of this problem, the better the world will be off, the better off the world will be. So what became apparent then was that even in the US, there wasn't um, any stock available because turned out, stock all came from China and and I'm talking to the very very highest levels of government so um, that we could not unlock supplies and this was you know a month to six weeks before it really hit America and so that was um, a, a, an eye-opener but to come back to the story of collaboration is how I saw people, of course, there was a lot of gouging and corruption. We've seen that, like some people have suddenly put the price up. Some people just bought for themselves and didn't want to share. I mean, it even happened with, um, you know, at a federal government level here because there is, there is one mindset that is all about me first and America first and to hell with everybody else. And at the same time, there were just as many people working very hard to counter that and help other people. So uh, who will win this battle in the long run? I think cooperation will win in the long run and collaboration will win in the long run as a species, our long-term survival has depended on that. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. Always look for the helpers. Yes, and and you'll find them, you know. So, um, I I met I met people who were when when things had eased in China and manufacturing and supply chains and supply lines opened up again, they were importing 
um, through families and networks of friends, they were bringing PPE into this country when the hospitals couldn't get them. But people used their friends and family and supply lines in China to get PPE in and supply them to hospitals and doctors. That, you know, and that, that kind of gives me hope. I think we need to maintain hope for humanity. You, you've got two daughters and they're doing interesting things. You, and you see the young people. Do you, what do you see of them taking on this sort of collaboration and open economy sort of approach? Mm, I, I'm not sure that my daughters are <laughs> particularly shining examples of altruism. Sorry, girls. Um, I mean, I think they have their own pressures, but um, they are they have shown solidarity with the Black Lives Matter protests. They've, um, they're very much of a generation that does not buy into these old systems of privilege. They see what's wrong in the world. They see injustice and they work hard at um, addressing those things. And um, they're very aware of their privilege and how they can also, you know, make, make sure other people get a fair go. Um, I mean, I don't know that just turning up in marches is enough, but, um, you know, I have definitely raised um, daughters who are revolutionaries and, um, We'll see what, what happens for them once they've, you know, gotten through their university education. Yola's in France, she was basically locked up throughout most of COVID. Um, the lockdown in France was very, very strict. Mm -hmm. uh, so they weren't allowed to even go out for a job or anything like that. And um, now she's working in a very small country village where there's not even a coffee shop. There's not a bar, there's not a coffee shop. There's like no commercial activity. And she, I spoke to her today and she said, well, the grocer who's a traveling grocer and it comes once a week has now gone on vacation. And so now there's no food. <laughs> when it comes to the village, they've got to go somewhere to buy it. So I sort of think, think and I mean, it's like half, it's, it's really charming. She loves it. She says, I wish I was here throughout COVID because it feels so free and it's not like in a big city um, and um, there's this space and you can be outside and outdoors um, and people help one another very much. So it's the country way of doing things. It wasn't necessarily the case in the city where they lived. I mean, I live in a high-rise building here where um, um, the neighbors take care of one another, but in a kind of a New York distant kind of a way. So you would knock on your neighbor every morning and because my neighbor is 83 and I would just say, just checking if you're still there. <laughs> and she'd kind of peep through the door and say, yes, I'm still here. Are you okay? And whatever, you know, because people are being very afraid of strangers as you know like now stranger danger is is real mm. uh, and you know we would send food over and that sort of thing keep each other a little bit entertained and so on what about yourselves Ooh, the lights went out. <laughs> i've been sitting still too long <laughs> what about yourself what are you seeing in sydney and in um in australia around you know, I mean, the COVID has not been so extreme there. Um, mm. It sort of seems to be picking up now, but um, have you seen collaboration and cooperation? Because all that made the news here was the toilet roll wars. <laughs> which, which were real. That was not made up nonsense, which I find fascinating in and of itself. Um, certainly, you know, obviously being part of the, the startup and the tech community here, Yes, there was a ton of collaboration and what we saw as well um, was just all the different pockets of the network and the community going, well, here's the bit I can contribute. Here's the piece I can. Let's have weekly calls or let's jump on a 
um, on a, a Zoom chat on a Friday night at 5 p.m. and still have drinks virtually. So we can still feel like the the whole normal world is still sort of tangible in some way. Um, and that actually spread to quite a lot of the community across Australia and New Zealand kind of clubbing together as well, which, which I thought was really lovely. Um, and I, the other thing that I'm really interested in kind of waiting to see whether this happens is you don't have to be in Sydney anymore. You don't have to be in Melbourne. You can be in Toowoomba or pick any other kind of part of Australia where you, you don't have to go to the big city anymore to prove yourself. You can do it from where you are. And I think that's a wonderful leveler. Um, but, you know, there are many challenges for you know, other parts of Australia that are perhaps very remote and rural. And do they have the digital skills and the access to technology to be able to do that? But you know, for a lot of Australia now, you, know, you don't have to travel to a main city to go to a demo night. They're all online. You don't have to travel to go to a conference. They're all online. So I do think there's a, there's a, a wonderful kind of um, democratization of access to great people and great information that's really been quite interesting. And I hope some of that stays. Well, I was very curious that... Um you know how you network in the real world by going to events? I was thinking, so how's that going to work now? And I figured it out because um, networking is what I do for a living and, uh, and it's core to my role. And so now I thought, okay, so how am I going to work? Because you're in a Zoom conference with 600 people. You can't even see all 600 of them. Mm -hmm. So I figured out the trick. You want to hear it? Yes. Yeah. Right. So here is the trick is um, ask questions in the chat box and um, a, you know, a good moderator will open up an opportunity for the audience to ask questions. And then you ask questions and you see who else is asking questions. And while they're asking questions, you quickly go on LinkedIn and you check them out. Mm -hmm. And then you send them a direct message in the Zoom call to say, oh, I see you're also interested in this and I'm looking for an expert in that, etc." And so I've actually made new friends through networking, through Zoom calls. That is excellent advice. Thank you for yes, this. Yes, yes. So it's, it's all about standing out. And to some degree, it, the same thing happens when you're at an event and um, let's say you stand up and you ask a question afterwards at coffee or something, people will say, oh, I loved your question. And, you know, that's an opportunity to, you know, start a conversation. Or you'll say to somebody else, I loved your question. I had the same question. So it's a natural way for people to connect mm -hmm. with one another. So Zoom does allow that. I think that is a really good place to end now. Thank you very much, Annalie. Thanks, Annie. And um, please like or subscribe to our podcast and see you next time. Bye. Bye.